Morning. All right, I want to welcome everyone to this month's Morris Bart lecture series. We have Jana. Do you pronounce it Jana or Jana? Jana. Jana. Okay, Jana Lippman is speaking with us. Let me give you a little background on her. Jana Lippman is an associate professor in the history department at Tulane. She teaches classes in U.S. history, labor and migration, and U.S. foreign policy. She's the author of Guantanamo, a working class history between empire and revolution, which was the co-winner of the 2009 Taft Prize in labor history. And she also has published scholarly articles on Vietnamese, Cuban, and Haitian refugees. In addition to her academic work, Jana has been active in public history, advising the Guantanamo Public Memory Project, which seeks to initiate dialogue and debate about the history of US intervention in Cuba U.S. immigration policies, U.S. detention policies, and human rights in the contemporary moment. She also has a long commitment to civil rights and social justice. Jana received a Ph.D. in U.S. history from Yale and graduated with a B.A. from Brown. So thank you for joining us and welcome to our Mars Bart Senior Lecture Series. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone for Zooming in. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and your questions. I want to thank Rachel um, for inviting me and for the Jewish Community Center here in New Orleans for hosting this. And I'm really hoping that this can be an interactive opportunity for us to talk about refugee politics in the past, which is what I know about, and potentially even a little bit in the present present. Um, what I wanted to do is I'm going to do maybe slightly different than some of the other lectures you've attended, maybe not, but I'm planning to speak um, for about 10 to 15 minutes and then accept questions and answers and then give another 10 or 15 minutes and take more Q&A. Um, so don't hold your questions to the very end. I'll be stopping at a couple of different points to hear your thoughts and your questions. So what is it that I have just written? I've just published a new book. It's called In Camps, Vietnamese Refugees, Asylum Seekers, and Repatriates. Um, and in many ways, this is a history about Vietnamese refugee policy. And it is about the policy of the United States and refugees more broadly from 1975 at the end of the Vietnam War through the present. Um, and in many ways, I'm gonna just quickly share my screen of the many technology, technological things that we can now do. I'm gonna go all the way back up here. This is the end of the talk. Let's see if I can get to the beginning of the talk. Here we go. So this is my new book. This is In Camps. And this is an image that many of you are probably familiar with. This is the end of the Vietnam War. This is an image which in 1975 was widely circulated. And it's meant to both show the end of the US war in Vietnam, um, what it means for the US to be leaving South Vietnam, as well as the numbers of Vietnamese who wanted to leave and here the US is saying, no, you cannot all fit into the helicopter. And in some ways, this iconic image has come to sort of stand in for US failure at the end of the war, as well as for US Vietnamese desires to come to the United States. Um, and many of you may be familiar with our large Vietnamese American community here in New Orleans, um, many of whom settled in 1975. In my book, I actually do try to trouble that image a little bit and say it's not just about 1975. And in fact, not all Vietnamese wanted to come to the United States. And instead, what I'm going to do is talk about refugee policy from 1975 to the 1990s. And I make maybe two major arguments or things I hopefully we can talk about. One is I talk about the ways in which um, where Vietnamese go after they flee matters. So trying to look not just they don't go straight to the United States, they go to refugee camps in Guam, they go to refugee camps in Malaysia and Hong Kong. I'm very interested in those countries in between. That's the first thing I'm interested in. And I think that matters for us today if we think about refugee policy in the United States. Right now, Mexico matters a lot. Lots of asylum seekers are going through Mexico on their way to the United States. What matters in Mexico? How about Syrians who are fleeing Syria? Well, they go to Turkey, they go to Jordan, they go to Germany. What happens in those countries in between in Turkey and Jordan? So that's the first thing I'm interested in. The second thing I'm really interested in is in activism. A lot of us look at that image and we see all those people who want to flee 
and they look as if they don't have a lot of political um, rights, or they're not trying to actually get to where they're, they're not looking as if they're politically active. They look more like they need to be saved, they need to be taken care of. Um, and I'm gonna talk instead about the ways in which they in fact um, were political and how they tried to use political activism, whether it was protests or hunger strikes or legal activism to get to where they wanted to go. So those are my main sort of points. Um, and I guess I'll just dive in unless anyone has any initial questions. All right, so I'm gonna go back into the share screen and I'll talk a little bit about how I got to this project and tell you about my first case study. I'm gonna talk about three case studies today. I'm gonna bring you to Guam, which is a small island in the Pacific. So we're gonna go here to Guam. We're then gonna go to Malaysia and then to Hong Kong. And here, of course, is Vietnam. And if we think about how I got to this project, why am I studying this? Um, it all goes back to when I was a college undergraduate. This is pretty embarrassing, actually. But in 1994, when I was a college junior, I studied abroad in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. And it really was life changing. It made me think about what it was like to be an American abroad, um, how to see the world in new ways. Um, and it really did shape my intellectual trajectory for the next 20 years. So it's a little embarrassing, but that's pretty much true. For this project though, it also starts with this image. This is an image that I found in the archives when I was doing some research on refugee camps in the 1970s. And this is an image which I find truly remarkable. As I said, most of us know this image, 1975, Vietnamese trying to leave. But what we don't know is that large numbers of Vietnamese, of course, do leave Vietnam in 1975, but they don't go to the United States initially. That helicopter can't get all the way to America. Instead, the Vietnamese are brought to the island of Guam in the middle of the Pacific. And while they are there, the vast number of Vietnamese are there and want to go on to the United States. Um, there's about 120,000 people. They're in Guam for anywhere from about two weeks to two months. And while they are there, there is a massive reprocessing program um, where they are sort of go through the bureaucratic process of the United States refugee program and are brought to the United States. And unlike today, where there's a very elaborate asylum process and people are interviewed and determined whether or not they're a refugee or not, at this moment, all the Vietnamese who show up are said, yes, you are refugees and you will be resettled in the United States. And what happens though, is that there's a small subset of about 2000 Vietnamese who while they're in Guam actually say, we don't want to go to the United States, rather we want to go back to Vietnam. And so this image to me was shocking. Um, I'm a US historian, I studied the Vietnam War and I was like, wait a second, who are these Vietnamese individuals who are protesting on a naval base? This is on a base in Guam. And look, they have an image of Ho Chi Minh, the leader of communist Vietnam. Why are they standing with this image? This is not Jane Fonda, right? Here we have these Vietnamese, Amer Vietnamese who don't wanna to go to the United States and who are arguing that they wanna go back to Vietnam. And here we have them again. Here they are um, protesting to go back to Vietnam. And you can see that they are having their heads shaved and the sign says 36 hours hunger sit in, quiet hair shaving off to pray for a soon repatriation. And these images struck all these questions in my head. Who are they? Why don't they want to go to America? And why are they shaving their heads on a US military base? And this began my research process. So as I said, these Vietnamese individuals, they land in Guam. And I was wondering, well, who are these men who don't want to go on to the United States? And they are majority male. And in short, why would anyone do this? I thought the story was that Vietnamese wanted to come to the United States. And I should be clear that the vast majority do, 120,000. 118,000 come to the United States, right? But who are these 2,500 who don't? And what I learned is that approximately 80% of them had been in the South Vietnamese military. Many of them had been in the South Vietnamese Navy. They were in ships that um, were at sea as the South Vietnamese government lost. We should know that the South Vietnamese government crumbles fairly quickly in April of 1975. Many of you might remember this moment um, as the South Vietnamese government collapses. And if you are a young man in a ship out at sea and the captain says, we're not going back to Saigon, all of a sudden you might've found yourself drafted in the Navy and yet your ship is never going back home. 
Instead, your ship goes to the Philippines or to Guam. Some really cannot believe that they're there in Guam. They said, quote, some of them Air Force mechanics and ships engineers were forced to leave by superiors. Others were told to get in airplanes and bring the airplanes to Thailand. And in a few cases, they were even drugged and brought out of Thailand and brought to Guam, which is the story that this man is telling here. Some of them were older. They decided they didn't want to resettle in the United States. And so this young group of men decide that they want to go back to Vietnam and they begin to protest. You should know that Guam itself is a small island in the Pacific. The United States controls Guam. They received Guam after the Spanish-American War. It is one of the sort of legacies of the Spanish-American War. Um, the US is able to get hold of it and it still is under US authority today. Guam remains a US territory. And so these Vietnamese realize they're not quite in America, but they're not really in Vietnam obviously either. How do they get back? And they begin protesting. And as you can see here, they write these signs. We request the US government to send us back to Vietnam immediately. They begin walking off the base um, and having protests. Here they're being met by security forces in Guam. Here they are having marches. And here they again have these massive protests and begin to have hunger strikes and in fact set um, parts of the base on fire. And they do this in order to um, get the attention of the US government and the Guamanian government. They're trying to get support for them to be able to go back to Vietnam. And again, I was really shocked by these images. This was not what I was expecting at all. Um, here we have these sort of really militant protests taking place on US military bases in 1975 on Guam. Here we can see they burned down some of the buildings on Guam where they were staying. And this eventually comes to a head on August of 1975. And to be honest, the US doesn't know what to do with them. They don't wanna force them to come to the United States. On the other hand, they don't have diplomatic relations with Vietnam. And so don't feel that they can send them back to Vietnam. Um, they are afraid of their safety and the Vietnamese government does not want them. And what happens is, is the Guam governor, a man named Governor Bordeo, says, well, why don't you let them go back on their own recompense? Let them go back in a ship under their own sail. And this is in the end what the US government allows. And they say, we're gonna take this ship, it's called the Tong Tin Wan, and we're gonna allow these Vietnamese to go back to Vietnam under their own power. And as you can see, they jumped for joy. I've always been really struck by this image, sort of the sense of both the youth of these young men and their happiness. And they are given this ship and they are allowed to go back to Vietnam under it. Of course, there's a lot of concerns. I was very fortunate to meet the captain of the ship, a Vietnamese man named Tran Dinh Tru, who eventually wrote his memoir about this experience. And although they are allowed to go back, um, in some ways, this is a tragic story because as they go back to Vietnam, the Vietnamese government sees them as potential CIA agents oh, and simply puts them into re-education camps in Vietnam. So Tran Dinh Tru, who is, a, a, he passed away two years ago, but was uh, in the South Vietnamese Navy for over 20 years. He is in a re-education camp for 13 years. And what this is, it's really a story um, of not knowing the future. In many ways, one point that historians talk about is contingency. He wanted to go home to be with his wife and children. Um, he was slightly older than those other men I was showing you. And he wants to go back to be with his family. And he didn't know that Vietnamese would be able to leave later through various programs. He thought he might never see his family again. So he goes back to Vietnam and is really tragically put into this re-education camp as were all of the other Vietnamese who returned. They were not all in the re-education camps for 13 years. Some were in these jails for three months, some were six months, some were three years, but they all faced repression and many then did come to the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s. Why do I start with this story? One is I think it demonstrates um, that who is a refugee and who is not can really depend on circumstances. Here, in fact, we imagine that everyone wants to come to the United States and is a refugee. In fact, we see a different story that many people actually want to return to Vietnam.
Secondly, we often think of the U.S. rescuing the Vietnamese and bringing them to the United States. Here we can see people protesting, people who don't want to come to the United States. And yet we still see a story that is fraught, that's about family separation, and is one where Guam plays this sort of limbo role where it's not quite America, but it's clearly a place in between. So in some ways, this story really brought me to the rest of the book, but it's one that I have sort of continued to resonate with and to write about. So I'm gonna stop there for a second because I think this story raises lots of questions. So I'm happy to take questions or thoughts before I talk to you about what happens in 1978 and 1979. But this is 1975. So any thoughts or questions? I guess my reaction. Uh, a woman named Loisel or Loidel. Can you unmute? And did someone else have a question? Okay, Can Loidel. you hear me now? Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, I just, how was it that they got swept up? <laughs> to leave against their will. I mean, it doesn't sound like it was the easiest thing to be airlifted or however they were taken off. There were so many people that wanted to get on and couldn't. How was it that that many got swept up in the departure? So I would say there's sort of two or three different groups. So one were again, young men. So if you were in the Navy, which is a lot of these men were in the Navy, they weren't leaving on the airplanes. These were, you were on a ship, you're on a South Vietnamese ship, you're out patrolling the waters in the South China Sea, and your captain says, Saigon has fallen, we're not mm -hmm. going back. So mm -hmm. the captain has made a decision, and if you were like a 19-year-old man, and you wanted to go back to your girlfriend, or your mom, or your dad, all of a sudden you're in Guam, and you're told you need to go to California. And so a lot of these men were not people who had been trying to leave. They were people in the South Vietnamese Navy whose really? ships were just patrolling and then mm -hmm. never went back to shore. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these people were like the individual Trand and True who I worked with for his memoir. Um, he escaped. He created a way to get his wife out as well. And she never was picked up. She was never rescued. And so he was separated from her and so he was like, oh my goodness, I got out, but my wife didn't. I want to go back and get her. So those were the two main reasons. Mm -hmm. okay. So it was unusual, but that's why you had these people who were in Guam and wanted to go back. Okay. To the Zoom for Rachel. So another question? Right. And then I'm going to stop there. It's wherever the hell you want. Any other questions? Ramon, do you have a question? Yeah, I guess my my reaction, again, to clarify, this is a small percentage of the total people we're talking about. And, and certainly it's understandable given their circumstances why they were there when they really won't prefer to stay. Uh, so why, why such an interest in such a, a very unique and small <laughs> component? Yeah. It's obvious that the great majority were in peril and, and wanted and needed to leave. Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good question. So you're correct, it is a minority. So again, it's about 120,000 people left at this moment. And most of them we said on the United States, Canada, Australia, France. I guess I was interested for a few reasons. One is um, because it's an unexpected story. So you're right, the number is not high. It's about 1,500. But those 1,500 people created a lot of um, anxiety and sort of complications for the US government and for the Guamanian government. And so I was interested in seeing how this group does mobilize. I was really surprised by how militant they were. I would not have expected that they would have, you know, gone on hunger strikes, they threatened self-mutilation. Um, they really escalate their concerns. And it does challenge in many ways um, I think the stories that the US tells itself. So part of the argument as well, which is more broad, is that the United States often, I would suggest, tries to minimize, um, or maybe minimize is the wrong word, but argues in the ways in which they sort of take the Vietnamese as the quote, doing something good 
at the end of the war. And in some ways that's accurate, right? Mm. But in other ways, I think that it minimizes in some ways hides over or sort of covers over um, the controversies of the war and in some ways a more complicated politics of the war. Um, and so I'm curious and interested in the ways in which they mobilize. I'm interested in the ways that the Guam government has to respond. And like there's one moment actually where Henry Kissinger won the documents, the um, US um, military is interested in sort of going into these camps, right? And saying that like, we need to put down these protests. And Ford and Kissinger are going, no, we cannot go in with military force to sort of suppress these riots. We can't be seen sort of hurting these Vietnamese in this camp. And so I'm interested in the ways in which it raises these questions for the US government, um, for Guam, and unsettles sort of these questions about um, how refugees or people who are in this refugee position um, do in fact have political voice. So I agree with you, it's a small group, um, but I think their story is really unusual and worth telling. Yeah, yeah there's another, another reaction uh, I had in listening to this. I, I guess I'm, I'm a Cuban immigrant and I identify a lot mm -hmm. with the Vietnamese. And, and you mentioned something about how we, they didn't go through a process like exists today of, mm -hmm. of asylum and so forth. And I mean, from speaking as a Cuban that mm -hmm. kind of identified with what happened to them, we're in, both the Vietnamese and Cuban were in, were in a different camp as far as the circumstances. US was in Vietnam in a war, South Vietnamese were fighting with the US government, there's no need to question or go through an elaborate asylum process for them. Same with Cuban, with Castro and communism. Uh, and you know what happened with the Bay of Pigs and, and the US government kind of uh, deserting mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, the fighters that went back. It's kind of like both they, the US government owed the Cuban people and the Vietnamese people some uh, you know, opening to let them get out of the circumstances they were in. So uh, anyway, I just that's a reaction. It's it's different than what you'd have now, not knowing who's coming across the border and what's their incentive, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So just uh, my reaction to yeah. that. No, so I would say a few things about that, and I appreciate your comments. And I also I think. It might have, you might have heard of being, I've done a lot of work in Cuba as well. And so part of my interest actually is in the comparison between Cubans and Vietnamese and the role of anti-communism. So I, I really appreciate that comment. A couple of things to add. One is that this happens in 1975 before the US has a refugee law. The US writes the first refugee law in 1980. And Cubans, in fact, enter the United States. And Ramon, I don't obviously know you, but you might be familiar with this, as might others. But the United States allows Cubans to enter and after the Cuban Revolution under what's seen as a loophole in immigration law. The Warren, I'm sorry, McCarran Walter Act of 1952 allowed the president of the United States to allow refugees to enter, and it allowed certain groups to be entered as parolees. And it gave the executive the ability to do this if he wanted to. So for example, the US President um, Eisenhower lets in Hungarians as anti-communist refugees in 1956, allows Cubans in between 1959 all the way up into Barack Obama's administration in the end of 2016. Um, but there was not a refugee law. And because of these large numbers of Vietnamese who leave in the 1970s, in 1980, we get the first US law about refugee politics. And this is still the law that governs US refugee policy today. And it both sets up sort of a parameter for people outside the United States to come in as refugees. And it creates asylum law, which is what we're talking about in politics today for people in the United States about whether or not they can claim asylum and meet the refugee standard. And one thing that the 1980 law is supposed to do is up until that point, the United States did classify people who were fleeing communist countries as essentially sort of almost automatically getting to resettle. So that was the Cubans and the Vietnamese. Right. And in many ways, those in politicians in the United States said, well, maybe we need to have a policy which would allow people who are not just fleeing communist governments to also get refugee status. And so that's where we get the 1980 law. It is signed by President Carter, and it creates this new framework for refugee policy more broadly. 
And I think what I'm going to do, Ramon, is I'm going to actually go back to my talk, but I'm going to skip my chapter on Malaysia, my section on Malaysia, and I'm going to talk about Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a moment where an asylum process, like we see today in the United States, starts being instituted on the Vietnamese. Okay, so very quickly, I'm going to go through this um, quickly, but I'll happy to slow down afterwards. So as I said, 1975, the Vietnamese come in. They're let in under this special policy called parole status, where Ford allows them all to come in outside of regular immigration channels. In 1980, we get the US Refugee Act, and you begin to get hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese who continue to leave, again, because they are fearing um, reprisals under a communist government. And again, the, con the Vietnamese government puts many, many people, hundreds of thousands, into re-education camps. And in the late 70s, you begin to have people leaving these re-education camps. You also have repression of Chinese, Vietnamese, ethnic minorities. And this leads to the, quote, boat people in the 1970s. And they go largely to camps in Malaysia and Indonesia and the Philippines. And these countries don't want these refugees coming in, just like most countries don't like refugees coming in. There's nothing unique to the United States not being super welcoming to refugees. Most countries are resistant to large groups of people coming across their borders. And these Southeast Asian countries are very frustrated that they have tens of thousands of Vietnamese coming in when they say, this isn't America's problem. Why doesn't America take these people? Why are they all in our camps? And this will lead in 1979 to a UN convention or conference, which will say Vietnamese who land in a third country, Hong Kong is a colony, but Hong Kong, Malaysia, the Philippines, they will get refugee status and they will also get resettled in a third country. And essentially it's a promise to the countries where they're landing, don't worry, these people aren't gonna be here forever. And it's a promise to the Vietnamese fleeing, but we are gonna get you resettled. And the resettlement countries are largely the United States, Canada, and Australia. So this is a formula that gets set up in 1979, and it more or less holds water until the mid-1980s. But in the mid-1980s, it shifts again. And I argue it largely shifts because of Hong Kong's politics in the 1980s. So again, I'm going to just shift here to share my screen again so you can see some of these images. Wait, here we go. And I'm going to move forward to Hong Kong. So here we have Hong Kong. This is the British territory of Hong Kong. Remember in the 1980s, this is a British colony. And if we look back to our larger map, I'll just bring it right here, do I have it? Yeah, right here. That we can see here, Northern Vietnam is closer to Hong Kong. And so what happens in the 1980s is Vietnamese continue to leave Vietnam Again, largely because of political repression, but arguably also because of economic deprivation. Again, these are often intertwined. Someone's economic well-being is often very much tied to their political uh, sort of situation. And so you have Vietnamese who are fleeing to Hong Kong in the 1980s. And when they get to Hong Kong, Hong Kong puts them into refugee camps. And these are detention centers. In some ways, some of them are actually in jails. Other of them are sort of jails that are empty, some of them are camps, and these dots all around the Hong Kong territory, a variety of these detention sites that are in Hong Kong. And initially Hong Kong has what are called open centers, where the Vietnamese actually are in the camps, but then work in Hong Kong and actually have to make money in the Hong Kong industry. But then Hong Kong says, wait a second, and this is too attractive, we need people to get out of here, and it starts a closed camp policy where the Vietnamese are sort of put in closed camps, which are more like jails, and they are not allowed to leave. And the idea is they will stay in these closed camps until they're resettled. And this is again meant as deterrence so that they will not want to come to Hong Kong. That they will be kept in a camp. This is an artistic representation one, but in very closed quarters, again, trying to deter people from entering Hong Kong. And yet this doesn't really work and the Vietnamese keep coming. And Hong Kong is sort of thinking, wait a second, why do we have to let all of these Vietnamese in? We don't think these are all refugees anymore. Yes, they're leaving a communist country, but these individuals, this is 10 years after the war, they don't face individual persecution. And what made it harder for them is that the United States would send their immigration officers into Hong Kong. They would interview these individuals and they would say, yes, they're refugees, they need to be resettled, but we, the United States, are not taking them. They don't meet our criteria criteria. 
Many of these Vietnamese who are leaving are from Northern Vietnam. We're really interested in the Southern Vietnamese who are fighting with the United States during the Vietnam War. These Northerners, we don't have any obligation to them. Um, and in fact, we don't see them as refugees. They don't have the tie to the United States. And Hong Kong is saying, wait a second, why are they staying in our camps then what becoming an increasingly long period of time? What became long stayer problem, which is that you'd have these Vietnamese in the camps for two, three years. The US doesn't want to resettle them. Australia doesn't want to resettle them. Canada doesn't want to resettle them. And Hong Kong is like, wait a second, they're just waiting here. Plus, we are going to be China soon. At this very moment, Great Britain is negotiating with China about our status and Hong Kong Chinese might end up being refugees after 1997. Why are we accepting all these Vietnamese? And finally, Hong Kong's policy at this time was that if you came from China, also a communist country, you would be immediately deported back to China. Hong Kong says it can't take all of these Chinese, right? It's small, China's massive. At the same time, if you're a Hong Kong Chinese, you might be angry. Why is Hong Kong allowing these Vietnamese to come and stay? presumably, seemingly indefinitely, well, my cousin from Shanghai cannot cross the border and then is deported, right? So Hong Kong is getting very frustrated by this policy. So in 1988, the Hong Kong government shifts the policy pretty dramatically. And they say, we are done with this 1979 agreement. These Vietnamese are no longer gonna be refugees. Instead, we're gonna have individual asylum screenings. And what we are going to do is we're gonna interview everyone and determine whether or not they meet the refugee standard or not. Much more similar to what we see right now in many of the debates in the United States. And this was really controversial because in the United States, the Vietnamese have been seen as fairly sympathetic, you know, leaving a communist country, refugees. And here's Hong Kong saying that in fact, that this is no longer going to be the case and rather their status has changed and now they will only be asylum seekers. And as one Vietnamese said, they were very anxious about this, how can the UN let us be forced back? What about human rights? Another individual asked the UN, have you ever lived under a communist regime? They are liars, you cannot trust them. And finally, another Vietnamese said, quote, look at the TAM, which they were referring to the Tiananmen Square massacre. And they said this in Hong Kong, you know, 1989. And initially, the UNHCR is really hesitant about this. This is controversial. They don't want to sort of sanction sending people back to Vietnam. This, again, is seen as opposed to the UN's policy against non-refoulement, which is sending people back to a place which is dangerous. And rather, they're really hesitant about this. But in the end, the UNHCR changes its policy 180 degrees and they decide to go along with Hong Kong's new formulation. And they say that after 1989, that Vietnamese who show up will have to be interviewed. And if they are seen to be refugees, then yes, they will get to stay in Hong Kong and then resettled in the United States, Canada, Australia, France, et cetera. But if they are interviewed and we think that they are not refugees, we think maybe they are simply poor and they don't have a political claim, or maybe their father had a political claim, but they don't, but we don't think that they themselves face political persecution, then we'll re repatriate them back to Vietnam. And this is a radically new experience for the Vietnamese, and in some ways shows, again, that it depends on if you're a refugee on time and place. In 1975 and 1979, all the Vietnamese get to be refugees. But here in 1988, 1989, it shifts. And now they're gonna to have to really prove that they are refugees to the Hong Kong immigration officials, as well as to the UNHCR. And this will lead, as I said earlier, to a great deal of activism. So I want you to sort of, one of my main points is the ways in which the Vietnamese in the camps, in fact, are political actors. They don't just accept this. Rather, they begin two or three different types of activism. One is they begin legal activism and they begin bringing lawsuits to the Hong Kong government, arguing that this asylum procedure is against human rights and is unfair. Um, and US lawyers help them. There's a man named Arthur Helton, who's an important human rights lawyer, who actually helped these Vietnamese with their cases, along with um, Hong Kong Chinese lawyers and expatriate um, British lawyers in Hong Kong. 
Um, this case, in fact, um, gets all the way up to the Hong Kong system. And ultimately, the Hong Kong government argues that this, they need to make changes in the asylum cases, that due process had not been heard, but that they can, in fact, have these hearings and that the asylum hearings can go forward. So they essentially put in more safeguards, but they say, yes, we can go with these asylum hearings. Secondly, they begin to protest, and you begin to see these protests in the camps. These are large demonstrations in Hong Kong. Here you can see the Vietnamese using the South Vietnamese flag. We see this here in New Orleans a lot. This is the flag of the Republic of Vietnam or the um, capitalist South Vietnamese government. We are victims of the Hong Kong screening. And you can see the ways in which they are demonstrating. These demonstrations also often become violent with the Hong Kong security guards. Um, and this is because the Vietnamese become increasingly um, concerned about deportations and they are repatriated en masse back to Vietnam. So we have here these images, um, which are really pretty intense in Hong Kong at this time. And here we can see an artistic rendering again of the Vietnamese protesting these detentions. And I interviewed a woman while I was in Hong Kong doing this research. And she talked about as a child how she witnessed these um, protests or riots and about how they affected her. She would watch lengthy hunger strikes, occasionally even deaths within the camp. And she explained how the Hong Kong press regularly wrote of the riots. But she sort of said quite ruefully, quote, they called our demonstrations or protest riots. She said, but whenever you go, you hear things like, you should go back. If you will not be, you will be forced to go back. There are announcements almost every day as you go around the camp. It's very small and crowded and you're mentally stressed due to the long and prolonged detention. You hear this all the time and you see people being carried into big lorries or transferred to another camp for forced repatriation. She spoke of the protests with some pride. And she also though said that she observed hunger strikes and self mutilations which she admitted were scary and unsettling. And so behind the barbed wire, you saw these increasing protests of Vietnamese arguing that they were in fact refugees and that they should be allowed refugee status in the United States and resettlement as opposed to repatriation. In addition, they worked with Vietnamese Americans in the United States, including Vietnamese Americans here in New Orleans. And they were able to, in fact, get supporters and allies among Vietnamese and Americans. A couple of different ways they did this. One is they worked with college students. They worked with college students, for example, the University of California, Irvine. And these students would um, publicize their cause. They would send Vietnamese Americans to the refugee camps in Hong Kong to teach people English, do art lessons, provide support. They also raised money for lawyers for Vietnamese in the camps in Hong Kong. So in some ways they were working as immigration rights activists and lawyers trying to help individual Vietnamese in the camps get their asylum hearings heard, get their cases together and advocate for them to get refugee status. They also have got support from Vietnamese Americans largely in Washington DC. These were individuals who would lobby Congress and in fact, a group called Boat People SOS was very um, instrumental in lobbying Congress members. And they got a lot of political support. And this was again, bipartisan. Um, they got Democrats like Nancy Pelosi. Um, Nancy Pelosi was interested because there are many Vietnamese Americans in San Francisco in her district. And also very conservative Republicans, Chris Smith from New Jersey, who really support the Vietnamese as sort of an anti-communist Cold War policy. And so both people SOS also sent lawyers over and lobbied Congress. And so you saw the ways in which the Vietnamese in the camps actively were working to get refugee status. And again, sometimes they were successful, um, but many times they were not. And in the 1990s, both Hong Kong, the UNHCR, and eventually the United States are very committed to repatriation. And they argue that they need to repatriate the Vietnamese because they want to end the boat people crisis and the thousands of people coming into Hong Kong and they want to end this refugee crisis. And this will end in what are often very um, uh, upsetting cases of repatriation where you see people being forced away. Um, the Hong Kong government argued that many of these repatriations were in fact 
voluntary. Um, there are, you know, many cases, thousands of people returned, but many of them were not voluntary. And so you can see um, very disturbing images like this one of the Hong Kong police um, bringing forcibly the Vietnamese onto the airplanes in Hong Kong and back to Vietnam. In the end, um, Hong Kong repatriated roughly 60,000 Vietnamese. Malaysia and the Philippines and Indonesia and Thailand repatriated about another 30,000 more. And what they did was is that they also though got, the UNHCR got large amounts of money from Europe um, that would go to Vietnam. So the idea was that the repatriates on return got several hundred dollars to help them restart their lives in Vietnam. Um, the EU countries also gave money to the Vietnamese communities to try to provide support within Vietnam to deter um, people leaving and to help the political economy in Vietnam. And then the UNHCR also sent observers to Vietnam to go and check on people to make sure they did not actually face political persecution. So the UNHCR had an office where they would go and monitor the situation in Vietnam. And the Vietnamese government, in fact, was very interested in playing ball with the UNHCR because the Vietnamese government wanted diplomatic relations with the United States. And so this, again, is the end of the Cold War. This is the 1990s. Bill Clinton is president. And so Vietnam had an incentive to not violate these agreements and to not individually attack the Vietnamese who are being deported um, because it wanted to have diplomatic relations with the United States. And so in some ways, I again think this story complicates who we think is a refugee and these politics of refugee um, resettlement and activism. So if I started with a group of Vietnamese you might not have been anticipating, and arguably a small number, but a Vietnamese who did not want to come to the United States, who are actively protesting to go back to Vietnam. I end with a story which you might also expect. Here were the Vietnamese who we might assume would be allowed into the United States. These were the US allies during the war. They are fleeing a communist country. And yet they too find themselves in camps where they don't want to be. And unlike the first group that was protesting to go back to Vietnam, this group is using all the same methods, hunger strikes, self-mutilations, massive protests, legal strategies to try to stop repatriation, to try to in fact get themselves resettled in the United States, Australia, or Canada. In the end, some of them are successful, but thousands of them are not. And this is a story which I think also um, when we think about stories of Vietnamese Americans is one that is hidden and is unknown and is one of the United States in fact, and in some ways the world community or regional community um, putting an end to who was allowed in as a refugee and who was not. And in many ways, I think that this story again does resonate in our present. One is to think about how the politics of who gets to be a refugee are politically determined that the United States has historically defined refugee status with anti-communism, but even that has its limits. And so to thinking about when does anti-communism provide a certain um, sort of value or sort of ability for one to have one's refugees claims be heard, and when is it not? How did the end of the Cold War in 1989 and the early 90s, um, and really in some ways undercut many of these Vietnamese stories of individuals who did want to resettle in the United States? If we think about cases today, um, one should think also, and in some ways I'm going to, Ramon, to your point, it might not be as straightforward as the Vietnam War or the US-Cuba relations, but the US has been militarily involved in Central America. And there are many scholars who argue that the US interventions in Central America in some ways are at some of the roots of many of the migration crises that we see today. Um, US policies in El Salvador and Honduras um, in many ways um, leading to many of the migrant crises or migrant sort of processes that we see of people coming into the United States today. Um, and yet those individuals are not clearly automatically seen as asylum seekers or refugees. Secondly, we see the importance of host countries in many ways that it mattered where people were going first. Hong Kong was very worried about its own political status. It cared a lot about its relationship with England and with China and was much less interested in the United States. The US had less pressure there. And so Hong Kong's own regional politics helped shape its own refugee policy. And again, I think that today 
Um, we have to be very attentive, for example, Mexico's policies or Jordan or Turkey when we're looking at questions of refugee politics today. Finally, to point out that these individuals are not passive, that they are in fact um, engaging in sort of mass political activism to the extent that they can within the camps, that they are able to both protest on their own as well as find allies in the United States. Um, and this also um, allows them a little bit more leverage. And so while these campaigns um, are not successful on a mass scale, thousands of these Vietnamese are sent back. Um, it does demonstrate the activism of the Vietnamese in the camps. And today, for example, in New Orleans and Louisiana more broadly, um, we continue to have asylum seekers engage in many of these same types of protests in immigration jails in Louisiana. Um, NOLA.com or the Times Picayune Advocate did a really interesting series. I'll try to look it up and put it in the chat about a year and a half ago about immigration detention here in Louisiana. Um, and there have been cases of hunger strikes um, as well as of protests in immigration jails today of asylum seekers protesting their conditions and also claiming their rights of asylum. Um, so in many ways, linking this to sort of longer histories of both asylum seekers trying to seek their rights, um, as well as about the changing nature of US asylum and refugee policy. Clearly today we have a new um, executive branch. Joe Biden is now president. One thing which is consistent, a lot of people who criticized um, the Trump policies and, and Trump's refugee and immigration policies, and I'll be straightforward, I'm among those who are very critical of Trump's refugee and asylum policies, should know though that um, US policy has always granted the executive a great deal of le leeway in immigration policy. That in and of itself is not new. In many ways, presidents have been able to shape both the limits and extent of refugee policy. Um, Biden has said that he's gonna increase the number of refugees um, placements in the United States. Um, but in some ways, this is still very much, um, the policies that we saw under Trump have not necessarily disappeared. There are also similar policies under Barack Obama. And we should think about these sort of continuities of refugee policies, and immigration policies, and also recognize that US policy has allowed the president in particular to have a great deal of leeway and when groups are allowed in and who is given refugee status and who is not. So that is a lot of information. I will stop there and I'm happy to take questions or thoughts um, or comments. Yeah, just Ramon again, any thoughts? I guess it's interesting to look at Hong Kong now uh, from having to think about how to handle immigration to looking forward and seeing how to handle emigration because right. of the complexity that they're in. Are you? Are you already starting to look at the whole Hong Kong issue and where it's headed and so forth? Um, a little bit. So I, um, I actually wrote an uh, essay, which maybe at the end of this I'll send to you. It's on theconversation.com. Um, but yeah, I think the Hong Kong story is really interesting. I mean, obviously Hong Kong, um, whatever sort of questions of free speech and political rights have been greatly limited. Um, the Chinese government has really been cracking down on some of the sort of establishment democracy leaders who've been strong um, sort of voices for more democratic practice in Hong Kong over the, I mean, there's been really sort of chilling effects over the last 12 to 16 months in Hong Kong. And what I did some research on is that um, in the 1990s, again, some of these Vietnamese cases were about habeas corpus rights. And there's a really interesting case in 1996 um, where when they're writing what's called the basic law, which is the law between how Hong Kong will be ruled post 1997 when Hong Kong becomes part of China, some of those habeas corpus rights that get sort of written into the law are because of the cases that the Vietnamese um, asylum seekers bring to the British Privy Court. So I actually see these as interrelated um, and I'm really interested in thinking about um, what's at risk for Hong Kong today. And you should also just note that the British colonial power is very clear that they will not accept large numbers of Hong Kong Chinese in the 1990s. And I'm looking into that as well. Today, the British government has said different things about to what extent they would accept Hong Kong Chinese or they would not. So it's something to really pay yeah. attention to, I agree. Yeah. Right, other thoughts or questions? Um, I know that Donna had a question earlier. Donna, do you still want to ask that question? 
Don, I know you had your hand up before. Did you want to ask a question? No. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll ask a question about U.S. criteria mm -hmm. for refugee status. Um, you mentioned the uh, anti-communist, but clearly there are many other categories as well um, that ha have come into being. Um, can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Thank yeah, you. absolutely. So the UNHCR definition, which I, I should put into this, this PowerPoint, um, the UNHCR definition is a person facing political persecution because of religion, politics, or membership of a special group. Um, and I, I'm paraphrasing that, but that's, broad, that's the UNHCR definition. So up until 1980, the US does not have a refugee policy at all. So essentially the president takes um, their own authority and they paroled in the Hungarians, paroled in the Vietnamese. There was no criteria, it was basically executive authority. After 1980, they create this um, law which matches the UNHCR language. So it, it continues to be the UNHCR definition, which is political persecution based on these protected categories. And they're actually pretty narrow. Um, they seem broad, but lots of people might not fall into them. And it's a policy, or it's a definition that's based on 1951. It's really in many ways a response to World War II. And so what happens in practice is two things. First of all, um, for the refugees in these camps that I'm writing about in Vietnam, certain claims are seen as legible. And so if your father was in the South Vietnamese army and was in a re-education camp, then you are sort of seen as a refugee. But if you were say in North Vietnam, this is my favorite story, he's a North Vietnamese man, he goes on a, a work program to Eastern Germany, he joins an independent union, he gets in trouble with the communist officials in East Germany, He's sent back to Vietnam, he gets in trouble with the North Vietnamese po police in North Vietnam, and he flees. And you would say, well, this looks like a refu political refugee. Um, he, you know, he's having all problems with all these communist governments. But because it doesn't fit what the US is looking for, which is the South Vietnamese military personnel, his refugees claim doesn't get seen. So that happens all the time, where that um, there's sort of a set story that sort of is seen as um, legitimate, and other stories don't match that. But to your point more specifically, then the other thing that happens is asylum law. And asylum law is also for people who are in the United States who are trying to make an asylum case. And that's what all the debates are today, is who gets asylum and who doesn't. And in the United States, this is often about immigration judges. And the question that it comes down to is, what is a social group? So in this 1980 definition, it's political persecution because of race, political identity, May, I think religion and a membership of a social group. And so that's been interpreted in different ways. So for example, if you are LGBT, does that get you to be in a member of a special so social group? And there are certain people who would argue that yes, because in many countries, if you're an out trans woman, then you would face persecution or violence that you should get protection. And then others would argue, well, no, we can't, you know, the US can't admit anyone, everyone in the world who's trans, not everyone in the world who's trans, you know, needs to be protected. And yet the, you know, advocate would argue, no, yes, like this is a social group, they get protection, right? Another category is women who face spousal abuse. If you face spousal abuse, and if you are, say, sent back to Honduras because your husband has threatened to kill you, does that create a social group? How about if you are a member of a gang and you're at risk of being murdered if you go back to El Salvador? Is that a social group? And so it's that sort of, that's the sort of the area of the law which a lot of these asylum cases um, get argued about. Um, is, is it political, and also is it political persecution? Um, and one of the sort of other points about sort of contemporary questions, a lot of the violence that particularly Central Americans face on return might not be from the state. Sometimes it is from the state, from the government. Other times they might face, you know, threat of violence from another person, from their spouse or from a gang member. Well, a narrow reading of refugee law says that's not a protected category. You need to be facing political persecution from a state government. Um, advocates would argue that for a broader definition, that that's a social group and you should be able to be protected. 
Um, so that's where a lot of this gets played out in the courts. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, but under the Trump administration, um, former Attorney General Sessions um, created many executive sort of decisions. The immigration law isn't subject, I'm getting in the weeds here now, but immigration law is not under um, our regular judicial process. Immigration law is actually administrative law within the executive branch. And so this meant that the Attorney General could sort of um, create new precedents or sort of create orders that uh, immigration judges would then follow. And a lot of it was trying to narrow this question of social group. Some advocates argue that we need to have a broader definition of who counts as a refugee. Um, but in my conversations with UNHCR colleagues and employees and staff, they're very worried about sort of reopening up that definition um, because there's been so much um, opposition to refugee resettlement that could actually make the definition smaller rather than broader. But for example, one big debate is about climate refugees, right? Um, like if you're a climate refugee, can you be a refugee? And according to the UNHCR definition, depends if you define them in a social group. That's sort of the sort of, the definition is very old at this point. Thank Julie, you. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I, I have one other th thought, if I may, yeah. about Guam, mm -hmm. um, which is what was the population of Guam? Because it seems like 120,000 people coming in there uh, could be somewhat overwhelming. Oh, it was massive. Yeah, it's a really good point. So Guam had a population, um, I think it was like just over 100,000 people. So basically doubled Guam's population. And so it was overwhelming. Um, Guam's population is composed of about, oh, I'm going to get my numbers wrong, so I'm not going to give them to you, but like a, you know, tens of thousands of indigenous Chamorros. The Chamorros are the indigenous population in Guam, and then a very sizable US military population. Um, and this group of Vietnamese is overwhelming. They're put in sort of tents all in the um, military bases. And so the Guam government is very concerned about this group. They're concerned about them staying. They're concerned about them overwhelming the resources. Um, in the end, the US military basically moves out these Vietnamese in a matter of about two weeks to three months. So most of the Vietnamese are resettled to camps in the United States. Many are then sent to refugee camps on US military bases in the United States. So Arkansas, Fort Chaffee, um, Fort Camp Pendleton in California. There are a couple of different military bases where they're then sent to the United States, where they then wait to get um, a resettlement sponsor, often through Catholic charities or Lutheran immigrant services. Highest um, is also involved, although to a lesser extent at this moment. Um, and so there's a way in which you are correct that the number is overwhelming. Guam does feel invaded, essentially, um, but it's for a fairly short period of time. Thank you. One, one quick question. Uh, so we've been you've been talking about refugee law uh, and uh, you know, during during the Trump years, mm -hmm. there was another element thrown in. Of, well, why don't we let's let's let the people in that are beneficial to to the country and our economy, and, and that's a whole different subject. How do how, how do those two things relate? And, and is and is this? I'm familiar with benefit of the country for like H one B visas and stuff, but not for not for immigration. Mm -hmm. So was that a new phenomenon during during the Trump years, and and how does it tie to immigration to to refugee law? Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good question. So immigration law and refugee law are intertwined, and you are right that they're distinct. So the United States has, um, I would say, has had three or four major immigration laws over the last century. Um, the last um, two that were sort of more about allowing more people in are at this point pretty old. In 1965, there was a law about immigration that was about family reunification and also about sort of economic sort of support. So jobs can then support. So if anyone is here and if you are you know, an immigrant, sometimes, or if you're trying to hire someone, jobs or employers can sponsor immigrants, right, with immigrant visas. Um, and also if you're a family member, if you want to bring your family member to the United States, um, this was all part of the 1965 Immigration Act, which got rid of quotas based on national origin. So in 1924, I'm going backwards, I should have gone the other way, but in 1924, there's the National Origins Act, which was meant to really stop Jewish and Italian immigration. Um, there was a way in which anti-immigrant forces in the early 20th century were very um, opposed to both Jewish and Eastern European and Italian immigrants as being unassimilable, as being undesirable immigrants. 
So the 1924 National Origins Act really cut the number of, of European immigrants and really only allowed European immigrants from England, um, Germany, and Ireland. In 1965, this new law allowed for family reunification as well as for um, jobs. And then in 1986, actually under Ronald Reagan, um, you got an amnesty law. The last major amnesty law was in 1986, um, which allowed 6 million largely Mexican, although not exclusively, um, to naturalize or to sort of, you know, organize their status, um, as well as for, you know, worker papers and more um, money for the border. There has not been another major law about immigration since then. So there's all sorts of debates about should immigration be based on family ties, should it be based on economics, um, and should we be more like Canada, should we be, I mean, they're all different models. And refugee law is somewhat distinct because with refugees, the idea is not that they're going to be economically um, great for the economy, although often it is people who study this, I'm not a social scientist, but if social scientists who do study this can show you that those who enter as refugees often are very, Economic, economically productive and do well um, for the economy. But, um, but the idea is that um, immigrants coming in, there's an important clause where they cannot be a public charge, right? They have to say that you will not take government benefits. Refugees, in fact, and unlike that, are actually entitled to some government benefits. The idea is that refugees coming in might, in fact, need government benefits. You should know that these are fairly modest. It usually involves Section 8 housing, food stamps for a short time, English classes, um, some job training in some times. So these are not robust. You know, you still need to work in pretty quickly. But immigrants, the idea is that the government does not need to provide any benefits. Refugees do come in with the understanding that this is to help resettle under a humanitarian basis and that they might need some government support for a short period of time. Um, and what I would say is that they're interrelated, they're not identical. And the larger point that I would make is that the United States, and people have been talking about this for years now, they talked about this under George W. Bush, they talked about it under Obama, um, Joe Biden has put this immigration policy forward to Congress, but clearly um, it seems that it would be useful to think about a more comprehensive immigration policy, maybe the thought about all of these questions, um, but there's not been a major change in US law since 1965, and there's not been a major sort of way to think about undocumented migrants since 1986. So um, I think it's clear that there's need for sort of new law or laws are not serving as well. Um, on the other hand, that will need compromise. And as we all know, our political system at the moment, it's been difficult to get anything um, sort of that complicated through. But this is but this idea of a more up-to-date immigration law, historians, there's policy people have been talking about for 20 years. All right. Well, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. I think we need to wrap it up. I'm sure you have some things to do. Sure. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Janet. This was terrific. I think Great. we can all agree with that really interesting talk. Thank you so much. And I would just say I'm always happy. I'll hang out for an extra two or three minutes. If anyone wants to just ask me a question individually, um, I'll do so. Um, and I'm also um, happy to put um, the article I wrote about Hong Kong in the chat. So I'm happy to hang out for a few seconds if anyone just has an individual question. Okay. But thank you all so much for your questions and your time. Uh, I've worked on this for a long time and I'm really just happy to share it with people and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.